It's impossible to finish it on time. Can't you just tell to the boss? What? And get fired? No way, Raja. This is a test. If we manage this, then we can get another junior to do the hard work for us. Don't you want to be manager? I don't know. I have a headache. We didn't eat properly. I'm not having enough sleep. Is this the kind of job that we were dreaming when we were in college? But we're not in college anymore. This is the real world. There is no order. Okay, young Turks. Now we're doing this assignment. Can you get it done? Mm hmm. I was just wondering why is it so important to finish it now? Can we do it tomorrow? Are you crazy? Is he crazy? Haven't you heard? Time is money. We've got a contract with customers, key performance indicators, corporate, <laughs> corporate regulators. This is the office world, not your mama's house. You might want to get out of here. Both get out. Keep doing this and you'll get a promotion. You'll be lucky you'll get married. Understand, beta? Do this, try well now. Keep working. Hey, Customers actually need the thing that we are selling them. Is my sole purpose in life is to help rich people become more rich? What makes you, your community, and the world come alive? What are regenerative livelihoods for the planet? What if you could work in an environment that is beautiful, with clean air, healthy soil, and sounds of nature all around you? What if you could use your head, hands, and heart all at the same time? What if work would be a form of exercise? People you work with care about you as a human being, acknowledge your contribution and help you grow. 
There is so much each of us need to do to discover our potential and learn to live with our shadows. Why should we have to do this and face this alone? What if the work you do every day brings all of us closer to the more beautiful world our heart knows is possible? There is so much work to do to shift our economy away from exploitation and pollution towards clean, zero waste production and fair trade. Why would that not be a serious career option? So what is an livelihood means? It seems to me is working with the nature rather than trying to dominate it, using all parts of ourselves, our head, heart and hands. Working with a group which gives us a sense of belonging and care. It is to play a really meaningful role in the society which makes a real difference. Wow, Shanda, Chabardast. Hello, good evening everyone. We welcome all of you here. And before we get into the day, uh, we will play a short game, a small to know each other, get a little energized, settle our energies. So, uh, give me very simple. Give your word, one word, and you have to make a hand gesture and a sound that you relate with, with that word, anything that comes to your mind with that word, a sound and a hand gesture. Simple. Does that sound okay? Okay. By the way, we can use thumbs up in all the Zoom features whenever you feel like, you know, saying okay, or you can use hand features. So, yeah. So, the word, simple word is curiosity. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this was a test. Uh, now we all will go together. Like, you know, it's nicer. Like, as I say the word, quickly don't think too much. We go immediately whatever comes to our mind and whatever hand gesture comes to us. The sound and a hand gesture. Okay. Mm. So the next word is destruction. Boom. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, you're playing a game. Okay. So I will ask everyone to unmute themselves and turn on their cameras for this game. If they can, it's nice to see your hand gestures and hear your sounds together. So can I'm okay. sending can you, you my okay. next word is alive. Ha! 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 Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So here is the last word of the game. It's community. Yeah. Oh. Love. Yes. 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 Oh. Yes. Oh. Yes. So welcome everyone. I hope you have arrived finally here. I would request I'm very excited that we are gonna spend next four days together. To explore this idea of a livelihood and I'll take a minute to talk about what we think uh, as a livelihood is how we define a livelihood so I think a livelihood is a very simple idea of saying that I do work I make my livelihood doing things which I really enjoy 
but it's not limited to that it's also about that by doing my work how much do i add to the community i am part of do i give earth my mother earth back or i take from it i exploit so most of the careers uh, most of the careers with with youth is very aspired to take up these days are very exploitative in nature um uh, and the list it's like 90% of them uh they plan it or you are exploiting the fellow being okay so the idea of a livelihood is okay, so you mute uh, this background noise a little okay thank you yeah so the idea of a livelihood is that the career which are not destructive in nature where we are not destroy exploiting the planet or a fellow being and i enjoy doing it there's this data which says 85% of people hate their jobs so it's also about loving the work we do like you know those all equations of life work balance is out when you really like your work then there is no balance needed the idea of a livelihood will deepen over the four days we have people who will talk about it but i wanted to share what we think as a livelihood is and yeah i think pragna will share a little bit more about the spirit of this festival which we have designed for all of you hi everybody welcome welcome to this space so just wanted to establish a few ground rules that we have here which we'll follow over the next few days firstly we are all here with a an open heart and an open mind none of us are trying to convince you of anything please feel free to express yourself make up your own mind about things that you hear and really express your views another thing is that this has been designed in the spirit of an unconference now some of you might have been part of unconferences before and some of you might be experiencing your first unconference that even here on zoom so the idea of unconference is that you're free to plug in and plug out whenever you feel you don't feel overwhelmed by the schedule by the packed things that we have for you if you want to put off your video and you just want to take a walk please do if you want to sit out of a session please do you are free another thing which is very important with the packed schedule is that we have to embrace this feeling which we like to call jomo so this is not fomo this is the joy of missing out there are so many choices there are so many interesting speakers and events happening and sometimes you might be feeling like oh i want to be everywhere at once so just make your choice from your heart join the space where you feel most attracted to in that moment and it will be fine and lastly i would like to say that we've organized this career mela in a spirit of guidance in a spirit of gaining more awareness and inspiration from all the livelihood workers who will be joining so yeah there will be opportunities for you but please treat this and uh, treat your conversations with the speakers in the space of guidance and back to prachi to tell you a bit more about the logistics of the design how the day will flow yeah thank you so now i'll just share how the day today and for the next 3 4 days are going to look like very quickly so we start with grounding session which starts at sharp 4 pm every day which is one hour talk with people who have been working in this area of livelihoods battling for this over 30 years and even more for you know upholding this idea and they will talk about the big picture of it the structure of the global economy the nature of it and why a livelihood is important what is a livelihood deepening that definition this will be followed by a panel session starting at 5 to 6 where there will be four career specialists each day and they will share about their why why they are into an alternative career or a livelihood which they are part of what brought them there what how do they thrive there their bigger journey bigger why following this we will have from 6 to 6:45 a deep dive so for example you got super excited about one of these four careers i'm sure you'll get more excited you'll get excited about more than one but you have to make a pick whichever one you feel at that time most you want to look and go deep into deep dive is designed to answer to have a dialogue with these specialists and practitioners to talk about if i want to get into this particular field 
what do I have to do? How can I learn? What are the possibilities? What is the scope? All those questions which we generally ask while making a choice of a career. So that's a space. This will be followed by a 15 minute break. Uh, which, and then we start at 7 o'clock in Hangout Space, which is 7 to 8. It's an optional space like all others. But I would also like to uh, impress upon you that it's also a very, very important space and we designed it to, for participants to know each other. It's a free space where participants can talk to each other, know each other, people who share your worries, similar concerns, similar interests. We just connect. So this is the space where you can find your community, more friends. So we really invite you to be a part of it at your own convenience. This is the last leg of the day is Launchpad, which is basically we curated some workshops. Of course, there are so many things we all need to learn. But in context of a livelihood, we curated some workshops, which can possibly help you understand, make a learning program, help you find your purpose. Uh, maybe if someone is interested in starting a venture, few steps on how can they do that. So these are placed uh, one each day. You have the schedule. So this is how our day will end. So yes, this is broadly the program structure. And I also want to tell, uh, we will be telling you about the navigation when there are four parallel sessions will be happening from 6 to 6.45. So we will be telling you about that navigation around 6 when we start to disperse into our individual sessions. So please be patient. And yes. Oh, yeah. And this bell just tells that my speaking time is over. So I hand it over to Pramya. Thank you. That's the bell you'll be hearing throughout the festival when some things are winding up. So uh, today we have with us Heis and Claude. And uh, the theme of the day today is deadlyhoods. So before we get into a livelihoods and understand that, we need to uncover this. So they're going to help us to do that. So the first speaker will be Claude. Claude Alvarez is an environmental activist. He's been in this field for more than 30 years and he's based in Goa. Claude believes that universities are for dummies and he very strongly advocates for all the non-human species out there. He campaigns tirelessly on all environmental issues through the Goa Foundation. So over to you, Claude. Pragnya, thank you. Prachi, thank you. I am um, so happy to be here at this at this at this um, at this meeting, um, and I'm so impressed that it's organized only by by um, people in the in the younger age group and uh, not by some old fuddy duddies around the place. I'm I'm sorry that you have had to to call me around to 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 talk about you know um, things. Um, but I can tell you that despite my gray hair, I'm, I'm basically a bum, an intellectual bum, who has no known purpose in life. I have no interest in any career whatsoever. And I've lived my life for the last 40 years without being employed by anybody because I'm simply unemployable by anybody. But these are my ground rules, and uh, every time Manish wants me to come and create some problem and to disturb well sedimented minds, then he, uh, you know, calls me up and says, "Claude, you come and come here for this meeting, and please unleash your usual gibberish on this, on these, on these unsuspecting uh, folk. All of them, as you can see, well-equipped professionals, people who are educated." Who are you know who have um, in probably gone through college and who are doing all sorts of things, but 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 somebody has to unmute yeah uh, mute mute somebody has to mute so I know there's this uh, as a matter of fact Prachi mentioned this. There was, a, there was an international survey done in the US of you know, the job satisfaction from, 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 um, um, from the formal um, jobs in the US. And you will be surprised to know that 90% of people who are interviewed 
and this is what you would call the high, most highly developed country in the world. Not anymore, maybe, but at one time when the survey was done, and 90% said they were disinterested really in what they were doing. And out of the 90%, 40% actually said we intensely dislike <laughs> the job that we are engaged in at the moment. Now, this is not a poor society or a developing society or whatever the, you know, the images that they have of all these sort of societies. This is you know, what you would call the highly, most highly developed society of the United States, where people who are, you know, gone through Harvard and all these big universities and so on, finally end up in jobs which they either positively dislike or they just wouldn't, if they were given something else, they would probably migrate into it as soon as possible. Now, this is the state of employment in these so-called highly industrialized societies. And I would like to use that as an entry point for getting into this discussion, because I used to read a lot when I was in college. And there was a book written by a very famous writer. He's no longer um, alive, called Ivan Illich. You know, I don't know whether you have seen some of his books. One of his books was how do you de-school society, de-schooling society? Because he, he knew what the school system was about. And one of the things that he wrote in one of his numerous books was that when the job situation first came into being, because jobs, this working for jobs, you know, for, for getting a kamana, for going to some place, and getting a kamana and then using that eventually to buy your food and to feed your family and so on, is not something that is, is a, a general experience of human beings till probably the early 19th century. I mean, before the 19th century, there was really no concept of things like jobs, that you went to some place and you stayed there for eight to nine hours and so on. As a matter of fact, when the first industrial machines began to be installed in different places in England, they couldn't get anybody to come to the factory and to sit in front of these ruddy machines because the most normal people who were you know, in society said, I mean, are you, are you joking? Are you serious? Are you, are you, you, do you really think that I will come for some money that you will give me and sit on a machine for eight hours a day or 12 hours a day doing the same thing. And this was the response they got from all society. Generally, all society in England said that, said that this is not something that you can ask us to come to because this is not something any normal person will do. So who are the first industrial workers? You would not believe it. They could only get beggars whom they rounded off from the streets and prison people from prison look at the look at the choice i mean people from prison have got no other choice <laughs> even sitting in front of a of a bloody machine for eight hours a day is better than being in prison so they accepted that as a second best option but the general feeling was that nobody in his right mind would want to spend eight hours a day sitting in front of at that time it was maybe a threading machine for making yarn or doing some process or trying to make a automobile car with you know this Ford's invention of interchangeable parts or whatever it is but today it's not not any much different when you have people who still go at nine o'clock leaving all the good things in life leaving their children behind them leaving their wives behind them and then go and sit in front of screen for over eight hours and do the same thing and sit and sit and sit and sit and watch something and do something with their fingers and consider that a, a job for which they get a kamana. Now the origins of that is there in that system that normal people simply refuse. But today's world, today's consciousness says that this is the normal thing to do. And if you are not doing this, you are abnormal. This is how the world has changed. This is how the world has changed. And largely it has changed through the educational system, because the educational system would also have been the same way most people 
would be learning naturally with, even without a school. Now, for example, for six months because of Madam COVID, the whole country has shut down. All the schools have shut down. But do you think even when you sit down quietly and think over it, do you think the children are not learning something? As a matter of fact, they may be learning more now than, than they were sitting within these four walls of the school and listening to some teacher who has been blabbering the same thing for the last 40 years, blabbering it all over again. And now they want to do it on internet, which is a little bit better system because the children know how to fox the internet better than they can fox the teacher. Because the teacher, you are, you are closed in a classroom with your teacher and you can't do anything. But on the internet, at least you can do all sorts of things. And you can even bug out, you can go, you can give fake messages and nobody is going to be able to to control you because you are physically out of reach. So once they sent you through this education system, they're designed by a very interesting Englishman who said that, you know, we don't want, we want just a simple group of people will, which will enable us to interact with the rest of the population. The rest of the population, we don't understand at all what they do, how they think and whatever. So in order to interact with them, we need a class of people who will speak our language and then act as intermediaries. And then the whole education system now for 150 years has been creating these intermediaries. Now these intermediaries are very funny people. Most of them are today in today's middle class. And their job is not to do anything creative. Their job is to be an intermediary between the Sarkar and the public, between the judiciary and the public, between the bureaucracy and the public. And this is their job. And in, if you look at the de definition of, of bureau, bureaucrat, it comes from the word bureau, French word bureau. Bu French word bureau means table. So whatever is on the table, they know. Whatever is outside the table is not something they should know about because that is not supposed to be known. What is the known world is known is what's uh, spread out on your table. So all the rules that you know, all the regulations that you know, this is not something that you yourself have put but your Mahabab Sarkar has put, which begins from 1857 when the time Queen Victoria took the, took the charge of this country and began a system of appointing collectors to collect the revenue and uh, for, 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 you know, um, system, this system, if 1857 prevails still today, your, your collector in your district is a person who is following a collector's manual, which was drafted first in 18. This is the society that has been created. So it's a society that has been created basically to ensure that you don't think and, 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 and you don't do what you want to do. But that's not your job. That's not your job. If you want to do what you want to do, then you don't remain in this system. You get out. You walk out. Now, by and large, in this country for the last 60, 70 years, many number of people have done exactly that. Manish and I used to discuss this very often and we used to call them dropouts. And one day we said, well, why do we call them dropouts? They're not dropping out from anything. They have walked out of this system. They said, this system is so stupid. We can do better stuff outside. We like, you know, whether it is Steve Jobs or Ambani or though I would not offer him as an example. But there are so many other people who said, sorry, like Tagore is a good example. At the age of 13, he said, Baba, this school and these headmasters, I won't have anything to do with them for the rest of my life. And if you had continued in school, you would not have got a Nobel Prize. But because he got out of school and began to do the things that he wanted to do, he eventually he became known as an international poet and he, was, he got the Nobel Prize. So this group of people which began to form under the learning societies and conference were all people who were not failures in any way. They, they didn't, they had not failed in anything. Because they didn't sit for any exam in the first place. They only assess the product. What is this that you are trying to give us under the garb of learning? And they found that it is a gobbledygook sort of universe, which is called academics. Now, nobody has ever able to figure out when this academics began to have such a big hold over our lives. 
that any person who feels that he has got to do some desirable stuff in life, he first thinks that not only that he must go to school, but after he goes to school, he must go to college and he must go to university. Now, these are the most dumb places in the world today. The most dumb. If you go to talk to, you want the latest today from any subject, you don't go to your university professor. You go to the internet. Where you find what was written yesterday. Your professor will teach you what was written 40 years ago. The same thing with school. If you want to keep your child backward, you will send him to school. Because over 10 years, they will teach the child the same thing, only a little bit more in depth. First year, what they have taught, fourth year, they will teach a little bit more. Okay, seventh year, they will teach, then they'll secondary. They call all these different labels primary, secondary, whatever it is. But every time, it is the same sort of stuff, which is the same sort of garbage, I would call, regurgitated in a little bit you know, more detail and then shoved down your throat. And you don't have any choice. You don't have any choice in the, in the system. Nobody gives you any choice from the time that you are born, first of all, with your parents having a stranglehold around your neck, till you go to school where the teacher has got a stranglehold and the headmaster and the principal and all the most obnoxious people that you can get in the world suddenly migrate into your universe. And then afterwards you go into a university where you have these you know, other university principals and these lecturers and all these exams and these attendance and so on. And at the end of which, you are willing to take out an AK-47 and shoot every vehicle because you don't know why the hell are you being put to all this. And everybody says, it's because of job. And that's what you saw. That's what you saw in the video. It's because of job. So the question you ask is, the question you ask is, why can't I do a job which I create, which I benefit from, which makes me happy, which makes other people happy. Why do I have to go in somebody else and get a job there selling some toothpaste or selling a motor car or selling something else and then get paid by him because that is his job. He wants to do that. Why do, you, do I have to be recruited to go and fulfill his project? And this is not a small time business. No? There are some people who surrender 30, 40 years of the best part of their life to working for somebody else in exchange for a fee and at the end of it they say I retire ho gaya. I malum ne kya karna hai. this whole society is filled with these 60 year old guys who have retired from the from their jobs they got some pension and they are floating aimlessly around they don't know what to do in the end they create more problems for their families because now they feel that their free time they interfere in practically everything and they don't give any people a chance to even move around. And you can always say that hey, at the age of 60, you have made all your money and everything. Why the hell don't you just, you know, now stop worrying about money. You're getting a pension. You're getting, why don't you go and join an NGO and say that you've got accounts to do. I'm very good in accounts. I'll do it for you, but you don't pay me anything. I'm just happy you're helping society. I'm here to help you. No, that is not possible. There are people here, even Supreme Court judges, who want to be employed after the age of 65. They want to head a commission for five years, for 10 years, because they will still get on the job, more money will keep coming, etc., etc. It just becomes a disease because you create what is called a category of dead individuals. Means they were, when they were born, they were bright, they were geniuses. By the time of 10 years of dumbing down in school, and then further dumbing down in college and being kept silent through the entire process of, of learning, whatever they were learning, <clears throat> they become dumbos. Then they go for employment and every employer says, Abhi, ya, kya kar sakte hai aap? I've had this experience. I've been an employer for, for the last you know, 20, 25 years. And you put an ad in the paper and people come and you ask them, what have you got? He says, I've got a MBA, BA, MBA, MA degree. So we said, no, no, we are not interested in that. What can you do? do. They said, we don't know what to do and we don't know what to do because we were studying. So I said, what were you studying? We were doing some coursework. We were doing some exams. So the result is that we are only good at doing tests, writing tests or writing examinations. But apart from that, we have no other skill because we are, you know, in no way. We, instead of putting us in a learning environment, they took us and put us on these wooden benches in a college 
and they said yeah to kuch ho jayega so instead of learning in the field for 3 years we came and worked in this in these rooms and of course there is nothing to learn there except for what is there in the books and what is there in the books is purana zamana really purana zamana in terms of you know not purana zamana in terms of mahabharat or you know uh, the so many of the older ancient texts or whatever it is because there there is real wisdom but purana zamana in terms of you know your political science was written by some third class you you know political science professor in 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 harvard university in 1930 or something that is your text today that is what i call purana zamana it is of no use to anybody it is no use to any individual anywhere it will not you know push you forward it will only take you backward because by the time you fill yourself with all that you find that you are progressively more and more useless in society because you having filled all that in your head you feel somehow ha huh, itna to aa gaya i am an educated person now everybody should follow what i what i what what i am going to tell them and anyway the rest of the world is uneducated so i have a good right to go and tell them what they should do and they are doing it all badly and i will show them what to do but then you say but you yourself don't know what to do because you are yourself in the classroom for so many years you have got no experience no but i have got label i got certification so that certification is useful and with that certification i can do whatever i want so if i get a certificate of becoming a wakil i can go to court and argue and i i will ditch my clients for you know firmly in the gutter for several years before i can figure out what is happening but i believe that i have got certificate if i have a doctor and a white coat you can you can see the arrogance of many of these medics who come out from from medical college you know just the moment they get their white coat they are already you know doctors they feel that they are doctors they feel that they can give advice they can feel that they can do this now all this is this is very 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 sad stuff it's most of these people like in the us as i said are practically in jobs which they never wanted to their parents may have forced them to their neighborhood may have forced them to grandmothers uncles may have forced them to do it but none of them were ever told look abhi aap to you are now growing up what would you like to do what brings you happiness and what would bring you pleasure and you know tension free life nobody have i went to speak in iit madras a couple of years ago and i asked them the same question and they said who asked you to be a iit engineer they said sir we became we came to iit because we got good grades so because i got good grades my fate was determined i had to go to iit after that lecture four fellows left the iit the same evening they came and met me afterwards and they said sir you know nobody ever asked us this question nobody ever so that is why you get soulless engineers you get soulless doctors you get soulless teachers you get all these soulless fellows doing soulless things end up with a society which is largely comprised of death deadly individuals they are not doing they are not what we call a live hoods they are deadly hoods because they kill people they kill people they kill the soul of you not kill them physically but they kill their soul and they kill their mind and they act like a wet blanket on whatever they have to think for the rest of their lives and they never get out of that type of situation so the bell has rung i don't want to go beyond my time and uh, i'll be we'll be there for for uh, for chatting or whatever it is but there is one piece of advice i would like to leave you all with before i get out of this and i keep telling my many of my young friends and they have all uh, they said no no this is not true i said if you can avoid being employed between the ages of 25 and 40 then you have saved your soul employed means corporate job sarkari job whatever other job i am not but job means where you surrender your life in exchange for cash if you get out of this you will be the happiest man alive the society may not be very happy that but those are your people who don't have your interest they they claim they have your interest in mind they want to do all this because they want you to be happy in life and etc but they really don't have the interest in life because they don't want to listen to what you want to do 
they have already have an idea of what what you should do for your own benefit and they won't allow you to get out of that panjara that panjara that you know that cage so i'm hoping that you guys have good discussions over the next 3 to 4 days you know i will end with only two poems the first is by by rumi was one of my favorite poets and he says if you want money more than anything you will be bought and sold if you have a greed or you are greedy for food you will become a loaf of bread this is the truth whatever you love you are and the second one line statement also from rumi that there are as many ways to god as there are people walking on this earth thank you and enjoy yourselves thanks so much god for the mark kholne ke liye getting us ready for the next days to come so our next speaker is hais so hais was born in the netherlands but uh, forever ago he came to india to work in grassroots uh, organic agriculture to work in free trade and now uh, uh, hais lives in oregon so ek do shabd hindi ke bhi bolta hai do char shabd tamil ke uh, so he's a nice hybrid to have with us today he is he likes to describe himself as a father a forest dweller a systems thinker and he's trying to edge along social change to create a more beautiful world and he will start to enlighten us a bit further on these deadly hoods over to you hi are you here thank you yeah 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 i'm here but uh, on my phone because the computer didn't work very well um can you hear me Yes we hear you yeah Hello Yeah All right great and um can um can somebody oh yeah so what they should say if for everybody who saw this 6 uh, minute uh, film at the beginning uh as evil boss in in the office <laughs> but I don't intend to do that as a job um so I I prepared some slides is it is it possible for somebody to show to show these slides Yep. Here they are. Yeah, thank you. So, <clears throat> uh you are confronted with a uh, apocalyptic uh vision. Um I basically googled for uh, apocalyptic landscape to talk about deadly hoods and um and I found lots of Halloween pictures. So I thought it was really apt. This is the season of Halloween. It's the season of death. Um and I want to talk about basically where claude was talking about the soulless um i have this image of these you know these harry potter creatures that suck the soul out of you as an individual so i'm going to talk about the same um that is happening at a level of a society i call it the curse of consumer capitalism um so yeah next slide so like good claude was saying in in university you hear like a 40 year old story um in economy and i would say in in governance we we hear many 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 100 year old story you know a lot of um what we are being told today about how society is best organized comes from adam smith i don't even know how many hundreds of years ago he wrote what he wrote um and basically we are told that markets are the best at um organizing resources they're much better than governments um and because markets are so good the organizations are good them are businesses so everybody wants to be a business whether it's a government or whether it's an ngo and um you know if you, if you want to be a really good professional and you will study what people in business do and you try and emulate that this is told that it's not just a story it's told that this is actually how nature works you know people talk about homo economicus who is the ultimate human being who is seeking self interest and maximizing um his own um selfish um uh, gains and because everybody is doing that we are told that society at large 
um, will find some kind of harmony. <clears throat> so, um, as you might, in my voice, I don't really believe in this story. Next uh, slide. So if we are so free, um, you know, could I choose not to upgrade my cell phone, for example? Um, you know, if I if I if I don't upgrade my cell phone, basically I can't communicate with my with my friends anymore. So I don't think I'm really free to to choose what I buy. Um, just like there was this poll about how many people hate their jobs, there was another poll which um, was asking how many advertisements does a random youth in the U.S. see per day, and it's three thousand. So in school, uh, on the bus at home, everywhere. People are bombarded with these messages that say, you are not good enough. You, know, you won't get a girlfriend unless, unless you buy this deodorant, um, etc." So do we really choose freely what I buy? And then you, know, you can think about freedom as individual freedom, but am I really free to enjoy all my possessions if I realize that it creates suffering? suffering of other humans, suffering of the planet. Um, and you know, if, if there's no real other choice, like right now I'm using a computer. You know, I know that people in China are jumping off the roof themselves because they don't like their job, but where else can I go to buy something that's the same? Oh, no, ah, okay. Um, thanks. I'm, I'm gonna talk really closely into my, into my phone and see if that helps. Um, next slide. So this is a little um, little exercise that I would actually um, want to ask you to do. And this picture is of a, of a middle class hipster wearing a t-shirt. You know, he smokes some weed sometimes. He has a smartphone. Um, he looks poor now and then on the internet. Uh, he eats chocolate. He drinks coffee. You can see everything that he does. Everything that he touches. Um, you know, he has blood on his hands, and uh, I this was true for myself. Like Pragnia said, I was working um, with cotton farmers, and I was um, going through Vidarba one time, and I was wearing a T-shirt, and I didn't know where it from. And as I was going through this, I I actually saw a um, uh, a farmer who was hanging from a tree. More and more farmers will kill themselves because the system is not working for them. So it's it's not just a hypothetical situation that I'm talking about. It's, this is about real people's lives that are, um, yeah, basically ending because of uh, what we're consuming. So um, just 30 seconds, look around you and, you know, Touch a few things around you, whether it's your your computer, your phone, your um, your furniture, and and ask where it comes from, who made it, what were the conditions under which it was made. So I hear that some people are not able to see the presentation. I'm, I'm even struggling to, to see myself, so I'm not really in a position to help you with that. Can we do next slide? So, <clears throat> you know, what I was saying is that none of us are free until all of us are. And this, these statistics are uh, just the illustration of that. You know, the, the richest 1% of India have four times more wealth than the poorest 70%. I remember when I started um, studying, it was something like the richest 20% were consuming as much as the other 80%. Um, you know, I won't <laughs> give away when that was, but um, as you can see in the second graph, 
this kind of income inequality is not shrinking. You know, there's this, this uh, story about capitalism that it says the rising tide will lift all boats. Actually, in reality, this rising tide, it's, it's drowning, you know, the majority of the population. And this is not just a problem for that majority of the population, it's a problem for everybody, as I will show on the next slide. So this is a very interesting uh, study that I highly recommend to read. It's called the spirit level. You know, one of these tools that you use to see if everything's straight. <clears throat> and it also talks about the human spirit. So what these scientists have done is they started mapping what social indicators, economic indicators, health indicators were coinciding with increasing inequality. And it turns out that entire societies are worse off if there's more inequality. So not just the poor are suffering, everybody is suffering. People don't trust each other anymore in an unequal society. There is more homicide, there is more suicide, there is more mental illness, there is more isolation, there's more loneliness. Um, life expectancy across the board goes down. So, you know, if we, if we think that it's just a matter of, you know, the poor people need to work harder and then they will also be rich, that's actually not the case. In an unequal society, everybody is worse off. Good question about India on the scale. Um, I was also looking for that, but I didn't see it in the, in the article. We can talk more about it. Okay, next slide. So this is about the social and the health and the economic effects. Um, as everybody is, I'm sure, aware, we are living on the cusp of the worst ecological crisis in the history of the planet. Um, you, know, you can say there are extinctions in the time of the dinosaurs, etc. but right now we've got um, a extinction which is induced by one particular species, and it happens to be us. And one of the ways we are driving this extinction is by basically ruining the self-organizing system of the climate. And in this graph, Oxfam shows you that this is basically due to the richest 10% of the people. So the rich people are responsible for more than half of all carbon emissions since 1990. And that second graph on the right will show you, um, you know, what is left of a carbon budget if we want to stay below 1.5 degree warming, which means that we can still have a meaningful agriculture system and so forth. Um, and it basically says that um, if the richest 10% keep emitting what they are emitting right now, it doesn't matter what the other 90% does. In, in a few years, all of that budget is gone and there's no more chance of a stable climate. So basically the planet cannot afford the consumption patterns that we are feeding into. And then next slide, I will explain what that has to do with deadly goods. Took this uh, quote from a um, t-shirt manufacturer, actually. He said, um, uh, direct, yeah, I cannot sell t-shirts on a dead planet. He's running a brand called Patagonia. And when he realized that, he decided to flip his entire business model and start um, you know, protecting environment, protecting uh, water, biodiversity, etc. And then he was being asked, oh, wow, you're such a do-gooder for society. And he said, no, 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 this is, not, this is in the best interest of my company. Because <clears throat> if we do business as usual, there's no more, there's no more consumer, there's no more call, there's no more business. So similarly, there is no more jobs on a dead planet. Um, so yeah, either we can all scramble ourselves down to the cliff and you know, elbow our way there and compete, um, you know, who, who gets to destroy the planet first, um, or we can realize this is actually, you know, unless we all seek out radically dead livelihoods and uh, types of work, there will be no more planet. Um, next slide. 
But meanwhile, as uh, Claude um, explained, we are uh, all applying for the same jobs are eloquently called um, by this author, David Graeber, bullshit jobs. And um, again, this is not something that, uh, that he came up with himself. You know, he didn't term these bullshit jobs. He was asking people, do you like your job? And many, many, many people said no. And I don't just hate my job, but I actually think the world would be better off if nobody would do this kind of job. And whether it is a corporate lawyer or a PR consultant or a marketeer or a brand manager or any of these bureau based um, professionals, um, people are realizing that, whoa, you know, uh, this is, it was interesting in this COVID time that people realizing if you are a healthcare worker or you are a farmer, that's like an essential profession. If you spend your time in most offices, you know, doesn't really matter if you don't come to work, you know, the world actually might be better off. And, you know, this is just for corporate people. Wow, thanks for the drawing there. Um, this is just for corporate people. You can think about people who are working in fossil fuel companies, mining engineers, um, you know, people working on um, the arms, arms race, you know, making more weapons so that China will be scared of us so that China will make more weapons so that we are scared of them so that we will have to make more weapons. You know, there's, there's no end. Or what about, you know, financial analysts that help rich people become more rich by um, trading stuff that doesn't really exist. So needless to say, nobody really wants to end up in this world that we have. No individual wants this for their children. The big question is, how the hell did we get here and why are we still stuck here? I remember reading this, this really shocking study from 1970 something called Limits to Growth. And it said that you know, we, are, we are exhausting the earth's carrying capacity and that we continue with business as usual, we're all screwed. This was in the 70s. This is what, 50 years ago? So this is my last slide and I will end with uh, some attempt of sense making because it's it's a pretty like a baffling situation oh there was one more slide you don't want to show the last slide hi mansani teaches us a depression oh. yeah this one um so you know the the iceberg uh, metaphor where you can only see what is above uh, the water level, but actually the, the big scary bits are below. So right now, this is a picture from um, a guy called Otto Scharmer. Again, another book that I highly recommend. It's called Theory U, like the letter U. And he talks about three big, big divides that are uh, plaguing society right now. The one we all know, ecological divide. So we don't see humans as part of nature, which, which is why you know, it's fine to destroy forests, you know, to you know, dig up more coal like we're doing in India right now, because those forests are not us, you know, they, are, they are the other. Um, the second big divide that we're also very familiar with in India is a social divide. Like we have on one hand, we have the Ambanis, and on the other hand, we have everybody else, the 99%. And, you know, when I first came from, uh, from Europe, I was shocked, you know, how can you just walk over a homeless person who is dying on the street? But after having lived in Indian cities for a couple of years, I was like, oh, that's just how it works. You know, the, the other is not me. And you can talk about this um, in many, many forms, whether it is classism or sexism or casteism. Um, you know, we have, we have so many isms that describe how we are othering people who are not exactly like us. Communalism. Then the third big divide is actually a spiritual divide. So currently we're talking about deadlyhoods because, you know, we realize that this, this soul, like uh, Claude was talking about, this soul is, is disappearing in our, in our work. It's disappearing in our society. It's disappearing in 
uh, in the organization forums that we, that we come up with and that we serve and that we see as the norm. So below these peaks that are, that are visible are all kinds of underlying forces and Otto Sharma described them as many, many bubbles that all need to burst. Um, you know, currently, Otto Sharma, yeah, when, when I have a free hand, I will type it in the chat box. Um, I'm holding up my phone right now. So we've seen in the 2008 uh, financial crisis, there was the financial bubble. Um, many people are talking about this COVID economic crisis. It's uh, driving us towards another financial bubble. All these financial bubbles are basically um, a symptom of the fact that the economy is not real. The economy is what is, you know, like what Claude was describing, everything which is on the desk top, you know, everything which is on the um, uh, financial models of the, of the Wall Street, um, they've got nothing to do with what people really value in their daily lives. Similarly, on a technology, you know, there's a technology bubble. Anybody who is uh, entering a software job right now, you know, chances are that they will be asked to do coding on how to sell advertising so that you can more efficiently, you know, make clickbait that uh, tells people to buy stuff that they don't need. You know, it's not meeting any real needs of any real people. Similarly, we have um, a governance bubble, a leadership bubble, you know, people who are in power, are people who want power, not people who want to be accountable. So you've got this vicious, vicious cycle that people who see that they're not accountable, they stop voting and they're like, okay, you know, these are politicians, these are netas, they do whatever they want. And because they're not held accountable, the people do whatever they want. And you know, this bubble is increasing, increasing, increasing. And you have ownership bubble. You know, if you have more land, you can get more loans because you have more collateral, which means that you will get more land, which means that more and more land or water or any other common resource is concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer and fewer people. It's not, you know, those people are not acting in the best interest of society at large. What I want to show with this slide is that it's not by chance that we are in this mess and that we are all seeking these deadly hoods who are basically forced to um, you know, consume things that, um, that are killing us and killing everybody else. But there's a system at play, right? There are a system with multiple vicious cycles. And what this guy, Otto Sharma, is, um, uh, is proposing that it has a lot to do with the level of awareness. So maybe at one point, you know, there was the king, and everybody understood that that is, you know, the one source of power. And uh, he calls that traditional awareness. Then after industrial revolution, uh, we got the market that entered and um, the two sources of power and everybody stole to eat. Um, this is what he calls ecosystem awareness. And as far as I'm concerned, we're still largely at that, um, level of society. Then if you look at uh, the country that I am from, the Netherlands, you know, various social welfare um, countries where you've got a strong civil society and you have some labor laws and a social security set up, um, you can say that these three sectors, market, state, and civil society are again um, at loggerheads with each other. And you can say this is um, stakeholder awareness. Now, <clears throat> I don't uh, think I'm supposed to talk about, you know, what's the way out, but um, because it happens to be shown on this slide, I'll give you a little glimpse of what at least people in this field who are talking about emergent new forms of organization are talking about. They're talking about whole system awareness or ecosystem awareness. So what is their argument is that they're saying if you can zoom out, you know, it's typical where interacting on Zoom right now, you can zoom out and sense into what wants to emerge, you know, on the level of not just me and the people, no, not just even our species, but the entire system, you know, what does the water want? What does the air want? What do the animals, the insects that are, that are surrounding us want? 
what what does this all want? We're learning a lot about how bees are communicating with each other, and we're like baffled, like whoa, this is such a sophisticated communication. They call it the wood wide web. You know, just imagine that all of all of life has consciousness, and what would be the system that would want to emerge out of all of that consciousness. Um, so that was um, what uh, uh, what I wanted to share. Um, the last thing um, I, I wrote it down while Claude was um, was talking about how he never took a job and was paid by anybody. Um, I have a, a slightly less radical version um, for those of you who still feel that sometime you might need to uh, take a job. I struggle with that question a lot. One mantra that uh, I try to follow is I won't do for money what I won't do for free. So if I would be inspired to do this particular project for you, even if you don't give me anything, then I don't mind you know, receiving some cash in return. But the moment I realize that, whoa, the reason I'm doing this is because I get paid, that's the moment to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the technology. It's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, with this, thank you, hi, so much. If there are anything, any questions coming up, please share with us in chat and we will try to get answers, anything that you want to write, express, please use the chat. Uh, but with this, we will quickly move to the next segment, uh, which is on diving deep into a uh, career part of the day. And we have our four specialists here with us. So before we start the panel, we will, I will just run through the navigation and the bit, which is immediately after this. And uh, yeah, so let me just show you how this, we will have 10 minutes. Each speaker will have 10 minutes uh, where they will talk about why they do what they do. Like the high said, I think they do it because they genuinely like it and they don't mind being get paid for it. So we will get there. And after that, uh, how do you go into your individual sessions? So Manita will be, Manita, are you sharing that or should I show them? Yeah, I can do that. Just one second. Sorry, just give me a... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so basically on the website, um, you have this option called the live calendar option. Okay, so when you click this, you will get redirected to this page, which is the open calendar page. And yeah, Prachi is putting the link in the chat. This link was also shared on your email IDs and we'll also put it on the WhatsApp group. So when you go to this page and you go to the date, you will see all the sessions are here. So for deep dive for six to seven, you have your four sessions here. So supposing you want to go in for creative therapist, then you just have to click on this and it will give you the Zoom link that you need to click to enter this room. Um, similarly, if you want to do renewable energy, then you need to click this and it'll give you the Zoom link. So you need to refer to this calendar when you have to choose the sessions from six to seven. And even on other days, for example, tomorrow, if for whatever reason you're not being able to find the link for this main room, you can come to this calendar and you have it here. So you can just click on this and come here. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. We can also share it again towards the end so that we have. Yeah. And also you guys are still live. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. So maybe we can take a 30 second break. Um, I'll just play some music for 30 seconds. If you want to grab some water or anything, please feel free to do that. And then we can go into the next part, which is the panel, panel dialogue with the speakers.
Okay, welcome back and a very, very warm welcome to our four speakers of the day. Um, today we have, uh, the, uh, let me just tell you the names of the four speakers who are joining us. We have Kapil, we have Shubham.